hand it over to Jack Jarvis and Richard Jingress for our newest uh, edition of Let's Talk News Business. Thank you, Anita. And uh, thank you, Richard, for getting up early and being here uh, or there. Um, this is a series that Anita and Melissa DePento put together of Let's Talk Business out of the News Innovation and Leadership Program here at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Thank you for coming in. It's my pleasure to talk to Richard Jingris, who's Senior VP for News at Google. And by the way, note that title because it says that Google cares about news enough to have a Senior VP for it, which matters. And Richard has done, in my view, a spectacular job over the years of improving the relationship that Google has with publishers, a relationship that's obviously been troubled in the past, especially in certain countries in Europe, uh, but uh, has really, through uh, News Lab and Newsgeist and uh, the Google News Initiative and um, projects like Subscribe with Google and AMP, uh, has tried to change the relationship that Google has with uh, news. Richard is also a trenchant critic of our industry, and we need that, and that's what we want to talk about today. And I want to, uh, the plan was to talk about investing in local news and kind of what do we do now. But given current events, Richard, uh, I want to start instead with a different definition of local, which is um, media aimed at the communities that have not been represented in mainstream media. Dr. Meredith Clark, University of West Virginia, University of Virginia, pardon me, has been working hard with ASNI to try to get even a count of minority representation in newsrooms, and that has proved nigh unto impossible. And so I'll go so far as to say, should we just give up after decades and decades of trying to get mainstream newsrooms to be more diverse? I'm not going to give up on that, but is that, but the, give up on that being the solution. And perhaps the solution instead is changing media ownership which means starting new ventures that serve African-American, Latino, and other uh, publics that have been underrepresented. So what I want to do today, Richard, is, is ask not so much what you would do with Google's money, though you have the ability to do something of that, just generally what you think we should be investing in and what we shouldn't be investing in. And so let's start with this question of the representation and service to especially African-American to black publics. What do you think we should be doing and could be doing now? Certainly, and obviously what you've raised is a extraordinarily important problem. Uh, not a new one, we should point out. Um, you know, as you, as you point out, sometimes I'm a critic of, of, uh, of our industry in its efforts to address these. Um, you know, I think all too often there's been a romanticization of the past of, of news uh, pre-internet era, uh, which I think is far more romance than reality. Uh, these are long-standing issues of underrepresentation. These are long-standing issues of lack of diversity uh, in newsrooms uh, without question. Uh, by no means do I feel we should give up on them uh, in any dimension, uh, whether it's striving to increase uh, diversity in newsrooms or striving to increase awareness of diverse populations that we serve. Um, I mean, in a sense, it, representation is crucial, but it shouldn't require representation for someone who's not a person of a, of a minority community to be sensitive to their needs uh, in the interest of creating you know, healthy overall communities, right? The, the commons is important. Do we understand the commons and, and, and how to address that? Um, but you also raise, I think, a very, very crucial point uh, with regard to ownership. Um, and I mean, I'll, I'll discuss this in many ways to the extent you'd like me to, but it has been long my feeling that the crucial issue um, that we have, particularly in the rethinking of news and in the recreation of, of a sustainable local news entities, that the core issue is ownership. And it's not about good or bad ownership. It's, 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 it's uh, obviously we want good ownership, but it's, it's more importantly about ownership that has a stake in the communities they serve. 
right? And 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 where we've gone long past that. I mean, that's still the case, obviously, in 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 some uh, uh, with small local papers, black-owned papers. Um, I spent quite a bit of time over the last few months with local news associations in the United States, um, including black-owned newspapers in the United States, Bayard Rustin and others. Um, you know, there are hundreds of black-owned newspapers in the United States. They too are facing the challenges of disruption. Um, uh, but they, like many of those community newspapers, at the very least, start with a basis of community ownership. Right. I mean, to me, one of the things that went awry with local news in our country was that it became such a frightfully successful advertising business um, in the 40 years from 1960 to 2000 um, that uh, that independent ownership disappeared in the place of chains, uh, large chains. And we know them. And it's not that chains, in a sense, are in and of themselves bad. They're not except that their focus isn't on local communities, right? You didn't build a chain of 300 newspapers because you wanted to do better at local news. That wasn't the objective. The objective was it was such a good advertising business that you could make it even stronger with centralized sales. You can improve margins, make it ever more profitable, seek ways to find efficiencies with centralized uh, production, so on and so forth, which in turn lowered the focus on local communities. And when that was a good um, business, it was a great business. But now, as my friend John Payton has pointed out, uh, most newspaper chains in the U.S. are controlled, if not owned by hedge funds, and the rest are owned by families that have pretty much lost their patience, I would imagine, with trying to invest. So yes, there's less of a stake in um, innovation in news in those companies. That's right. Um, and, you know, and, and, and obviously worst case of all with the hedge funds, but even without the hedge funds, uh, and no question, there are some, there, there are some, you know, remaining chains in the United States that have well-intentioned leadership. I think McClatchy and Craig Foreman are yes. really doing their able best, but it's yeah. almost an impossible position to be in, right? Because one of the things that we forget, and one of the things I would urge everyone on this call today, if you're interested in local news or interested in news in general, in the business models of news, is make sure you understand the past. Um, and I went into this several years ago with an article, that, you know, how can we reinvent the future of news with a misunderstanding of the past? You know, as I pointed out, it was a frightfully good advertising business. Uh, newspapers in 1985 were the internet of their communities, and you went to them for everything that you needed. Uh, in terms of local information. And, and city council coverage was, for, you know, tiny part at the bottom of the list. It was where do I get my mover reviews and you know, where do I get the coupons to shop at the local supermarket um, and so on and so forth. And, you know, there are four major advertising categories of department stores, auto dealers, supermarkets, and classifieds was 80% of their revenue. Um, you know, so it was a great advertising business. And when I Frankly, I have to note that often when I talk to the remaining chains, too often the discussion becomes, how do they rebuild the business of the past, which frankly is impossible yep. and not even necessary. And I would say not even healthy. All right, before we get to local and, and something that is dear to your heart, I still want to stay on this issue of African-American media. Um, and, and we have a center for community media at, at the school and we just announced something was long in the works is, a, is an initiative to black media. And we hired Aaron Foley to head that, which is great news. And last week he had an event with existing publishers, new and old. And yes, they are, they are doubly um, uh, challenged in this time as every publisher is. But we also need new publications. So I still want to press one more time on the question of, in, in specific case right now, investment in black media. If, if you had a pool of money, and I'm not again suggesting that's Google's money, but if there were a pool out there, where would you put it? How would you make a difference in the ownership structure of media around serving African Americans? Well, I would follow, in a sense, the same rules that I would look to follow with regard to the recreation of local news in general, right? Uh, I mean, these are all important local communities, um, uh, communities of color, communities of geography, uh, so on. Um, and, you know, and, and as I look at that, and you and I have discussed this, 
you know, for all of what we've discussed about the difficulties with traditional models, we know there are new models that will work. And I won't get into them now. We'll have time. We'll do that in a minute. We know there are new models that will work. For-profit models, non-for-profit models, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I think we're closely getting to the point with the understanding of these new models that it becomes reasonable to say, how can we make available these understood proven models for local news and pair them with identified local entrepreneurs or existing owners Mm -hmm. uh, who understand and live in those communities uh, who have a stake in the success of those communities and then pair them uh, as best one can uh, with appropriate local financing to get those or financing, I should say, not necessarily local to get those businesses started. All right. So let's go, uh, let's go to that. Um, uh, because I think one, one, one factor here in, when it comes to local is it's just a matter of what communities you choose. What towns do you choose? Uh, have we redlined journalism to white communities uh, I think Patch had that problem in the early days where they went for the juicy communities with juicy j- downtowns. And how do we get into communities that have been ill served and better served? So take that model in either kind of community. Now I spoke to you a few weeks ago and, and I was talking about a few models and you said, Jeff, Jeff, as you tend to do, um, look at Village Media. Look at what Jeff LG has accomplished with Village Media. And he's, Jeff is great and he's Canadian. So he's nice as can be and generous as can be. And he's been at News Guys. And he's talked about his model. And I spent a couple hours with Jeff, and I think he's watching now. And Village Media uh, is very impressive. It has, uh, I think it's about 40 uh, outlets now, some owned by Village Media, some franchised in essence, uh, with revenue upwards of a million dollars or more with a small staff. It's, it's, it's nothing surprising. It has uh, local news. It has local ad models. But it's profitable. It's sustainable. It's working. Um, and, and you have been a, uh, a fan of what Jeff is doing. Talk for a minute, if you would, about what impresses you with him particularly and with Village Media particularly as a model for others. And there are others out there. There's Tap Into here in New Jersey. There's others like this. But Village Media has stood out. What makes it stand out? Yeah, there are others out there. And, and many of those are, are, are similar to Jeff. Um, but yes, Jeff has stood out in my mind. And and uh, I mean, I met Jeff for the first time, I think it was about four or five years ago, I had to testify um, in a Canadian government session and he was there as well. Um, and he talked about his experiences with Village Media and, and my mind was blown um, because his thinking about the model was extraordinarily thorough um, and detailed and logical and supported with his own developed good tech. Um, uh, it was it was very smart. Yet it also wasn't rocket science. Mm-hmm. I mean, much of this comes back to the basics of what community news and information can and should be, which to some extent has disappeared. Right? He places a a keen sense on 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 again on serving the community and and in many ways, you know, we all know here who are involved in journalism how important, you know, accountability journalism is, extraordinarily important. However, accountability journalism in and of itself is, 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 is not the full solution for a community. And in fact, it ignores large elements of need, informational need in communities, which can allow the models to succeed. So Jeff, he, A, he focuses on on identifiable communities that have a sense of self. And he provides a richness of community information. That's everything from what's going on at the high school, you know, what are the new restaurants that are open, so on and so forth. Um, And so he has a thoughtful model in terms of of coverage, that it's it's, it's, it's all that informational glue that makes a community work and allows a community to engage, allows a community to have bonds, right? All very important. And then beyond that, he's been very sophisticated with all the tactics. Um, He has a very precise playbook. um, And we've used that playbook now with others 
in some of our local experiments, but it's very precise. He says, like, the day you launch, you be, need to be ready to, uh, to, to solicit and take every email address you can find, right? Begin to build the connection. In many of his communities, he has 60% of the population getting his daily email newsletter, right? And that is his primary driver of engagement. Uh, is his daily emails, right? So how does he create that kind of ongoing engagement? You know, he creates, he has very precise markers in terms of how much content the site should have in a given week to drive that continuous engagement. So then when it comes to the accountability journalism, there's actually an audience for it. And secondly, that audience and engagement allows him to be successful at local advertising, which allows him to sustain it. And it's local advertising. So as he's probably told you, I don't think I'm telling anything out of school, 85% of his revenue is custom local advertising to local merchants. And 15% of it is programmatic through you know, services like Google's, but it's custom local advertising. He's only beginning to look at the notion of memberships, which he thinks can boost it even further. And they will be memberships, not subscriptions, which I think is also key in local communities. Right? You're not creating a product just for those who can afford to subscribe. You're creating a product that's valued by the community and hopefully you can get those who are more able uh, in the community to contribute more to make them successful. I mean, I could go on and on yeah. and I would urge to study it, but it's very effective. He's proven it over and over again. He's not the only one. There's an outfit in Italy called City24 that's doing a remarkably good job in, in several dozen cities in Italy. Um, and I, you know, and I just realized in saying that, that, you know, I said, I don't think change are the right answer. And I don't think change are the right answer. And even Jeff will tell you that, you know, which is why he is, he has evolved this model that is, you could call it franchising in a sense. He is also in each of the new cities he's gone into, you know, he's hired, He's hired people from the local newspapers, right? So he's got embedded local leadership. And he's, of course, very sensitive and wise to making sure they have that strong tether to the community. So we take uh, this thing. Not all be that way. Sorry about that. We take this thing that, that as you say earlier, uh, we want to take models that we know work. This is why American Journalism Project I like, because they're taking Texas Tribune and Chalkbeat and saying, we know that works, let's extend it. We know Village Media works, let's extend it. In talking with Jeff, I heard echoes from what, you had said to me, and I, th I would identify the three challenges here are finding the right talent, making sure they're trained in, in that method, and then uh, having the capital to get them going. Uh, Jeff told me to get a village media franchise going uh, in a town of 50 to 150,000. We're gonna talk about what doesn't fit in that definition, but in, in roughly those towns. Um, costs roughly $250,000. I forgot to ask if that was Canadian or US, but close enough for jazz. Um, and uh, if you're going to start a, a, a successful business, uh, then you need not necessarily, you're probably not going to be, you're never going to be, we're not going to be VC uh, fundable. I don't want it to be VC fundable. It's not that kind of, of, of multiple, but it could be fundable as loans. It could also be fundable. Joe Amditas, who's one of our, our graduates from the school, uh, who's now at Montclair State working with uh, local media there, asks about another model, which I think is interesting, which is, um, cooperative ownership, community ownership, you know, is it, so if we got, I think finding the talent is, 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 is job number one, because you've got to find people who are locally engaged. You've got to take that person who's going to be good at business, who's going to figure it out, who cares, right? Fine. Then the next thing is to train them. We're a school. I'll volunteer to be hamburger. You, we can figure that out. But then three is the hard part is to scale this, um, uh, whether it's village media or another company, but to take that as a model, uh, it's going to take some money. Uh, what are um, uh, some possible sources of that money, whether it's an investment or whether it's a loan uh, or whether it's cooperative ownership? How could we imagine communities uh, at some scale starting to say, we're going to build our own, we're going to get this going? So let me kind of take you through my chain of logic on this. And, you know, I've, I've spent a, a good portion of the last several years uh, looking hard at local. I mean, so I first of all wanted to say, like, are there models that work? What are the models that work? Uh, can they translate, 
right, we set up the local experiments project, which is not a huge number of projects, but that wasn't the point. We took the village media model and we've now, in, we've, we've now had others use it in other cities and they're in the process of building those. We went to Berkeley side in Berkeley, California, which has done a really great job in Berkeley um, and, and provided them with support to see how would that model scale, for instance, in Oakland, California. Very different model uh, in all both community focused, but Berkeley side is nonprofit. Um, um, uh, obviously, Jeff LG's is, is, is for profit. So let's figure out the models. And by the way, I think it's true with any media form, you know, as they evolve and as technology causes their evolution, you know, you go through a period of time. I'm sure this was the case at the beginning of radio is, well, what formats work? What's an ad? You know, how does that work? Who buys them? So on and so forth. And eventually you get to a point of reasonable understanding that says, oh, that's the model it works. And then they scale. When you, and then it becomes much more predictable. And when you get the predictability is when you begin to open up opportunities for funding. And you're right, this is not venture financing. This is not that kind of funding. This is, it is more likely loan funding. And it come from, can come from communities, it can come from others. So, you know, like in my own thinking, where I am at now is I think we've gotten a pretty good sense of what can work. We have more work to do there. But what, I'm, I'm, what, I, what I am looking to do uh, over the coming year or so is just what you said, is how do we go beyond that now? If you've got the successful models, what are the best methods to identify uh, local entrepreneurs? Are there methods to provide training and support to those entrepreneurs? and make sure they understand what they think they're going to do. Um, you know, the Y combinators that are, as it yep, were, yep. maybe local news. And then can they be lined up with financing? That's either from national sources, maybe Google would be part of that. I, I can't say, this is obviously all on a very formative stage, but you know, I would be pleased, uh, very pleased to, to be part of that. Uh, and so I, I, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've always been very optimistic and as difficult as it is, but I think, we're beginning to get to that point where we can get to that level of scale that in a sense, like franchising, I mean, I, the word, I, I, the, I'm, uh, like word franchising with McDonald's, McDonald's University, right? Is it, you got a proven model, you got local entrepreneurs, you help them understand how to do it. They get financing probably from their local banks. Um, and, and it works. Can that you happen? Provide the structure, you provide the structure for them. Uh, That's right. Uh, you're right. And so I, I think, the, and again, those are for, those are for profit. Uh, nonprofit, I think, similar things, right? John Thornton, I'm close to John Thornton. I think he's done a remarkable job with the Texas Tribune. Uh, I like what he's trying to do with the, uh, the Journalism Philanthropy Project. Um, I have spent a lot of time, not enough apparently, because I haven't succeeded yet, you know, with, with other foundations trying to get them to understand that there are, is, there are successful models and it is and can be effective supporting those models, community foundations and so on and so forth. I think that's very possible. You mentioned co-ops. Interestingly, um, I happen to spend some time up in, fair amount of time up in Mendocino County, California. Uh, and I got to know the folks there at the Mendo Voice because in Mendocino, the Fort Bragg advocate went to a hedge fund and they're kind of, going through their ultimate demise. But the Men No Voice stood up several years ago and is doing a remarkable job. And they decided in the last year to form a cooperative, right? So it's owned by its community, supported by key members of its community. I think these models can work. Um, so, you know, again, I'm optimistic. I mean, there's a lot of hard work, but you can begin to see how the pieces come together. So I, I've, um... I've asked you this as Richard Jingris, concerned citizen. You you mentioned Google, but but just in, in broad terms, what do you hope? And I don't mean specifically village media. I uh, and we're going to talk yeah. about LMA in a minute. Uh, but in broad terms, what do you hope the role of Google can be um, in helping local news? What what are you doing now? But what do you wish you were doing? What I've always hoped uh, we could do, um, and, and we're doing many parts of this, you know, the approach I've taken, and you and I have known each other for a long time, um, 
and I've been saying many of these things for a long time. Not that I'm prescient, just that I'm kind of old and, and, and you know, after you know. a while, better. Um, you know, I've long felt, and you can find this going back a decade or so, that you know, the, 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 the challenge is even, the challenge is not just about the business model. That's the other thing I would say. Mm-hmm. Let's not kid ourselves that it's just about the business model. Not about kid ourselves. Let's not do ourselves a disservice by assuming it's just about the business model. Because that assumes that everything else about journalism is hunky-dory, has been done superbly, and is appropriate to our time and age. Amen. Most importantly, the last, right? And we know that's not the case. And we know that's not the case from every standpoint, from the perspective of how do we how do we serve underserved communities, to how do we serve all of our communities with a with with valued and respectful journalism and respected journalism, right? We need to rethink what news is. We need to continue to rethink what journalism is. And frankly, I don't. I, I that's an area where in, in Google, you know, I've I've said those things. I'll continue to say those things. We've done many, many things to try to stimulate and enable change. You mentioned AMP in terms of site design. Uh, We've developed tools for immersive storytelling. Uh, We have tools available for data journalists now to slice and dice large corporate data, large corpora of data to do good data journalism. All of these things that begin to look at the dimensions of journalism in a different way, right? That to me is as crucial as anything else. We have to move beyond our, our current sense of journalism, which doesn't always serve us well, right? One of my biggest concerns is, is, and we see this time and again, and I understand it, and it's the nature of the beast, uh, but it's not good enough, right? Um, I, 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 I don't have the best example today, but I'll, I'll just use one that comes to mind is, and it really comes off of the notion of it bleeds, it leads, right? I looked at the situation um, a few years ago with um, uh, the London British Parliament attack, you might remember. Uh, and I think four people died plus the shooter. And our cable news networks went wall to wall for three days, repeating the same loops of violence, the same loops of violence, right? We've seen this time and again. I won't even bother to try to cover the number of times we've seen this. And so they not only put undue focus in that case, it was like, you know, you put all this focus on a terrorism event that happened around the world. And what I also noticed was in those same three days, there were mass shootings of four or more people in the United States every day that didn't get covered. And we wonder why people go to the polls voting based on a fear of terrorism, based on a fear of the other, and not based on an understanding of what's important in their community. That maybe, you know, the high school graduation rate isn't what it shouldn't be, it should be. You know, or the use of, of pesticides in the fields of Iowa aren't what they should be. Uh, those aren't the things we know. How do we change that? How do we give our communities a better sense of what the key metrics of their community are such they know what to focus on politically? I don't believe in advocacy journalism in the sense of taking a precise position and driving it to the end, but I do believe in advocating for the principles of a community. Amen. We keep a spotlight on the principles of the community and measure ourselves against them and cover the issues that relate them and give people a sense of what the optional solutions are. That, to me, is advocacy journalism that can and should work. And and it's enlightened self-interest. There is a study uh, that I linked to in my post uh, that found that everybody in this field is talking about for some time that found that towns that lost their newspapers ended up paying 5 to 11 basis points higher for debt because they weren't as well run. Uh, a newspaper performs uh, an ability. Alexander Borchardt, our friend in, in uh, the Q&A, by the way, if you have any questions, challenges, arguments, anything, put them in the Q&A and, and I'll look at them. Um, uh, oh, I see more. Um, ask what the right kind of size is for community. And I mentioned that it was 50 to 100,000. The other thing that Jeff told me for Village Media is that, is that what works best in their view is a community that is fairly self-contained. I live here, I work here, I was born here, ideally, and that it's not a suburb, which is to say that there are things that don't fit in the, in the Village Media model. There are towns that are too small, 
There are cities that are too big. Maybe it'll work, maybe not, but, but not test it. So my only point is there's more innovation to be done with more models. One thing I'm excited about, I talked to Richard Anderson, who's, who started Village Soup in Maine. Um, and he's looking at kind of a transparency as a service model. I talked to InnoCode in Norway. They have a means where they basically sell transparency as a service to the town. Um, maybe that's a model. Maybe we even get revenue from the town. Ben Franklin uh, was both the newspaper publisher and the postmaster and the official printer in Pennsylvania. We can look at lots of models and, and, and figure out what works here. Um, so you've talked about um, the not-for-profits and there's great things out there like City Bureau and Outlier and uh, uh, American Journalism Project. Um, are there any other just creative models of any sort uh, that appeal to you that you started to see uh, the kind of folks that if we were having news guys, you'd want to invite there because they're doing neat things that people should see. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I think on the business model side, we've mentioned most of the major ones. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think beyond that, and I'm going to, I'm going to fail at coming up with a list today, uh, which I apologize. Well, what for. different question there, Richard, what do you wish people would explore? What's, what's unexplored what out I, there? What, what, I, what, I would, what, I, what I will wish people would explore is, it's, it's, it's sort of what I was saying at the beginning. I think we owe it to ourselves to ask and reassess every facet of journalism and what it can be, right? And it's not, and I, and I say, that's an intellectual process. It's not to suggest that everything needs to change, uh, but it's say, is it appropriate to our time and age, right? You get into, for instance, issues of article length or article form, you know, to what extent is, is, is the narrative form useful today? I'm not saying it's not, obviously it is. How do you go beyond that? You know, what about infographics? What about data journalism? How do we get, substantive information into the minds of our citizens in ways that they can comfortably accept in a generation where we're all holding Nizzy in our hands 24 hours a day. So every dimension of the model from storytelling to business model to marketing to how you engage with your community. Let's talk about that. Um, so you mentioned community size and you're correct. And Jeff, the first conversation I had with him four years ago, he said, I'm very conscious in making my bets as to picking a communities that have or have the opportunity to have a strong local identity. Um, and not surprisingly, that is easier at a smaller than larger size, right? It, it, it can start to break down, no absolutes here. So his markets range from I think 30,000 to 300,000. He's actually interested in now looking maybe at at segments of a metropolitan area just to explore. But it's all about that sense of community identity. And if you think about it in reverse, I mean, one of the issues with the big legacy papers, particularly the metropolitan papers, is what's their community? What's the community of the Dallas Morning News or the Los Angeles Times when in Los Angeles, and I lived there for many years, Los Angeles is a city of 150 cities, right? So where, where's your sense of identity? So there's not necessarily a precise bit of math there, but it is about recognizing the importance of that and feeding into it and building upon it. So how are you engaging with the community? How are you soliciting their needs and interests? Are you doing the town halls? Are you doing ongoing research? So I'm gonna use that to go into one other, I think extraordinarily key point, which I feel is, is, is often missed, um, and that is, is what is your value proposition to that community? And I'm gonna use that marketing term because ultimately this gets down to economics, right? Who's going to, who's going to pay either for the advertising or for the membership or for the subscription in my community? And nothing has changed about economic principles in that you will pay for what you value. All right, so how do you want, you know, what is the value proposition you're offering your community? Do they recognize that? Does it resonate with them such that they will step forward and engage, step forward and subscribe or contribute or whatever? And that is so often missing. I will tell you, I have had, because 
you know, you mentioned our subscriber Google project. And as a result, we've worked with many publications around the world on their subscription efforts. To me, the most wanting aspect in all of those efforts, and most of these were legacy, was they haven't studied their markets. I repeatedly ask every publisher I meet, what's your market research budget? What are you doing to understand your community? And so often what I get back is, oh, we study our logs, we study our usage. And I go, study your usage? What does that tell you about your audience? That just tells you about what your current audience is clicking on today. At a larger, right, how I, do you listen? How do you listen to your public? Precisely. You know, I can remember one, and I, I obviously I won't name any of these, but a very major city in the United States owned by a very major chain. And he said, our number one objective is subscription growth. And I said, what's your research budget? And he says, zero. And I'm like, wait a second. How can you possibly succeed at that? I had another one we were working with say, Richard, our subscription growth isn't that good. Would Google take over our discovery funnel? I went, no, we can't take over your discovery funnel. That's about your community. It's about your market. It's about your audience. It's about what product you put together that expresses the value that your community is telling you that they want from you, right? No one can do that for you. Only you can do that. And by the way, it need not be expensive. You know, when I say market research, we could Google- Go to the bar and listen to people. You can do it for free. You can go to bars and listen to people. You can get 10 people to come to your office or you can yeah. go to their home. Lots of ways to do this, you know, on the cheap to give you a sense of, of, of what your community wants from you. And interestingly, that's what you will often find, by the way, is the thing that they don't come back with is, oh, give me accountability journalism about the community. Not that that's not important, but they're also going to tell you, I want to know who died. Oh, yeah. it's matter. Yeah. <laughs> right. I want to know what's going on in the schools. Uh, I want to know why that restaurant closed. And I noticed it had a sign up that said there were restaurant violations. Right. I mean, it's it's grassroots stuff. So it's just, none of this is a is in a sense, like I said, it's not rocket science. Let me mention one other model that, that I, I, I get kicked by our alums if I don't mention uh, Simon Galper and one of our alums as a. Um, uh, effort around info districts in New Jersey he's trying to do, which is to, is to also bring in potential local funding. Um, so we've talked about a lot of mechanisms to fund, a lot of things to fund. Uh, let me press you on one thing, which I did on Twitter yesterday. Uh, Google announced a $15 million uh, investment in ads associated with the local media association, um, kind of putting ads to support local news in all those local publications. I was a little querulous about this uh, as, as an investment and what that really accomplishes. I said so on Twitter, we engaged. Um, uh, so explain what the rationale was behind that, what you hope to, to, to produce with that investment. Well, there are a couple of things going on there. Um, one is um, I at the same time was in the process of putting together the journalism emergency relief fund uh, that we recently did right, where we have now funded, we've provided funding in a range of, of like roughly $5,000 to $30,000 to almost 6,000 publications around the globe, right? This is a, a, a pretty huge effort. And so we put this program together about two months ago or so. And in doing that, I, 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 and I'm just going to lay, because this isn't the way it worked out. I went like, is there a way for us to get a multiplier on this? And so I had thought, gee, could we do this in a way that says, in addition to this money, can we support, can we, can we help support programs to encourage community support, to encourage advertisers to keep advertising, to encourage subscribers to subscribe and so on and so forth, right? Because as you know, a lot of the advertising has disappeared. And no, and, and obviously at a time like this, it's important for advertisers to step up. And so I had originally thought of this as an effort to pair along with it and say, let's do a matching fund program. Well, that proved to be way too complicated and understandably so, and maybe not even necessary. So we simply split them apart and we said, well, let's kind of give it a shot anyways. And we had had, um, uh, we've had very good relationships with the LMA and the LMC um, and, and other associations in the United States over the last several years, you know, putting together all programs on all of the things we're talking about here today. 
uh, Nancy Lane and folks. They, they do a really good effort. And so we said, well, let's just do something with them, um, with these associations. And, and, and it's also another vehicle for us to get dollars into, into small news organizations that otherwise we might not get to. So that was the genesis of it. Uh, support your local news. Um, and, and I was pleased we did it. And it was, you know, yeah, it was $15 million in marketing dollars that that went to organizations that typically might not see marketing. And that goes out automatically. That's all going out at once. So it's in the crisis, they're going to get a, a, an injection. That's right. All right, let That's me ask right. you, let me ask you an unfair question now. Um, and I'll pick an outlet because there's a few where this is happening, but the Philadelphia Inquirer's editor just left uh, with a lot of stuff going on now. Uh, triggered by a, by a headline, but there's other issues there in terms of diversity. It's time for change there. They've been trying to figure out how to change. They have Lenfest, but it happens to be an open chair. So if you were uh, the editor and or publisher of the Philadelphia Inquirer tomorrow, my sympathies, what would you do with it? That's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Off <laughs> Which is a way to buy time. I would, I, would, I would start with following the principles I've espoused, which, is, in, which I think is particularly important in this case, is are you, are you listening to your community? Are you connecting to your community, right? So to me, it's not, I mean, I think that's the, one of the unfortunate things, it's just the nature of the beast of, of newspapering is it's top down. Right, it's yes. it's it, it's me, the journalist, speaking to the masses, um, and that's never a particularly good thing if you can avoid it. Right? How do you flip that model around so that you understand your audience? So should you listen to them? So I think clearly there, most importantly, is to listen and to visibly listen. I remember having a conversation many years ago with the editor of the Atlanta Constitution. I don't know to what extent he did this, but I thought it was an interesting idea. And maybe it was an idea that we just sort of, uh, you know, brainstormed through and it never went beyond that. I don't know, but I'd still put it forward, which was this, is why don't you make this part, make this in a sense systemic, is that you say on a quarterly basis or whatever it is, that you purposely engage with your community, you do listening tours, you do town halls, and so on and so forth. You ask people, what are the, what are the community issues that we should give focus to, right? And then you very specifically emblazon on the front page of your site, yeah, we're gonna cover all the news as it happens, but by the way, you told us that these three issues, you know, traffic at the downtown interchange, uh, the state of the schools, uh, potholes in the streets, whatever were your key issues. These are the spotlight issues. And, and, and here's our coverage. Here's how we're looking at those. So I understand the issue, identify possible solutions, make you aware of those solutions, work with town leaders to make sure they understand those solutions in moving the ball forward. The whole point was not just listen to your community, but emblazon that as part of your brand, right? That you are, I'm a strong believer in constructive journalism and Ulrich Hagerup's work in constructive journalism, which is not agophysy journalism. It says, cover the bus crash at first in Maine, sure, but also go deep and understand why did that bus crash happen and go beyond that and say, what might the solutions be? And, and, and be purposeful about that such that your identity becomes one of an advocate of the community. Obviously, then people might be more inclined to support your efforts. That's, I'm going to plug the school once more. That's exactly what we teach in social journalism at the school. And by the way, we just reopened admissions knowing people's lives are changed. So come look. One last question. I've been, I've been getting in questions from the, from the, uh, the Q&A in the chat, but one, one more in our time left. Uh, Noor Malas, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing your, your, your name correctly, uh, ask what the role of the national news outlets is vis-a-vis -vis local journalism. New York Times is doing well. Washington Post is doing well. The networks, though their advertising revenue I just saw was down 27% as a whole. Um, that's temporary probably. They're doing well. They have national or international audiences. Maybe they shouldn't bother. Or do they have a moral responsibility of some sort or an economic benefit 
what should their role be? If, if you were talking to particularly the New York Times and the Washington Post, is there anything they should, and the Associated Press uh, and the cable networks, is there anything they can or should be doing to help uh, the state and business of local news? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think from my sense, what, if I were sitting in those chairs, what I would look to do, uh, I don't know how much they can do or should do. Um, I, 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 I want to be clear about that. They're very different entities. They're national entities. Um, um, I don't, I'm not concerned about the state of the sustainability of these national entities. Um, and I'm also, I, 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 I have to say there's always some concern of, uh, you know, I, I don't want our news agenda to be driven by a few number of outlets, right? So, but I, I do think can, might, might a national outlet do more in terms of how it collaborates with local news outlets um, um, to the, either in, you know, sharing techniques um, in, 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 in working together on common stories. I mean, you know, I mean, a good case would be, um, uh, and this touches on a number of things. Let's look at police brutality. Um, you know, to the extent, for instance, that someone like the Washington Post could use its resources to do deep, deep analytical studies of police brutality around the country, uh, to what extent can that be shared and collaborated with local communities around the country, right? How do you how do you take and, and get better reach and depth and coverage on that same kind of story? How do those local news uh, those local entities maybe help fill out the data? Um, and by the way, on that core issue, as I said earlier about the need for us to give our users a statistical understanding of their health of their communities is how do we continue to apply pressure to local governments to be transparent in the future? I mean, uh, in the first place, you know, police brutality being a key thing. I mean, uh, you know, uh, all of these things, right? The governments have varying motivations to be transparent about the data they have. So there too, can national entities be maybe more useful with their strength of voice uh, to make sure these channels of data uh, are available to folks. But I would look at it more as a collaborative effort uh, between uh, national and local and, and, and do everything possible to avoid the hierarchical approach of big national entity, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, um, what's the right word? Uh, I don't have the right word, uh, you know, helping the news entity. It's not, it's the local news entity. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't buy that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I am so often extremely impressed with the people I meet who are doing local news. And they're doing it because they're passionate. They're doing it because they're connected with their communities. Uh, they, they, and, 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 and that's so damned powerful. And I don't think they need people from a national level telling them how to do their jobs. But I do think they can benefit, obviously, from the, from the uh, enhanced capabilities that some of those larger organizations have simply because they have size, right? Right, and, and know, Washington Post is, is selling its... I'm sorry, Washington Post is selling its technology to those local outlets and trying to bring that to them. But well, we're, we're a little over time. So, uh, Richard, I want to thank you very much. I'm going to tell a story on us that we were once on a plane together, conspiring and talking and gossiping. And the, um, the flight attendant came by and asked us whether we were brothers. So, my <laughs> brother, uh, thank you very much uh, for this. It's just the white hair, of course. And I'm grateful you're doing this. I hope you're well and safe in California. And I want to just plug one more thing, which is next week, in this same time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, I'm gonna be talking, I'm delighted to say, with Rafat Ali, who is a brilliant entrepreneur, started paid content, then started a great startup, Skift. Unfortunately for Rafat, he A, covered travel, and B, the essence of his business was events. So he got hit with a double whammy, but if anybody's gonna come out of this and figure out how to come out of this crisis, uh, it's Rafat. He's brilliant and he's tough, and so we're gonna to talk to him next week about how he's faring in all this. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you, Anita, Zelina, and Melissa DePento for allowing me to do this with them. Uh, thanks to everyone in our News Innovation and Leadership Program for inspiring this. And thank you all for being here and stay safe, stay healthy. Bye. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to the group and particularly for your passion and effort in, in, in helping us address the, the needs and the 
um, and again, creating a, a powerful and sustainable and innovative future for local news. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Take care, everybody.